decision for life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Today, uh, I've entitled the message, Survive or Thrive, Which Will It Be? Um, we've seen in January, February, and March, um, about a quarter of a million babies that never had a chance to live because they were aborted from their mother's womb. Uh, we've been told that the abortion clinics can stay open. Uh, the ABC stores are essential, but churches are not essential. Saw in the news recently where a pastor was uh, incarcerated for opening the doors of his church and preached and people came. I listened to the governor of one of our states um, very blatantly, proudly, in your face, say to churches, we will permanently close your doors. So now then, we, uh, at the order of our governor and uh, at the encouragement of our federal government, we are hovering in our homes under the threat of a pandemic. I am reminded of uh, the passage of scripture in the 82nd Psalm. If you have your Bible, you may want to look along there with me or your iPad or whatever device that you have where the scriptures are located. I don't know about you, but I really am grateful to live in the era that we're living because it doesn't matter. But if I have five minutes, I can take my phone out and I can be in the word of God about anywhere I am. And so I love that. So, so whatever device you have, look with me uh, in Psalm 82 and beginning in verse number one. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Uh, he says, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. Listen to this. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Or they're being, as one translation says, they are being shaken. The foundations of our world are being shaken to the very core. I wonder, does that sound familiar to anybody that's listening? Uh, could it be that you heard it this morning on uh, today's news? I think so. You see, our country and the foundations of our country are being shaken to the very core of its existence. Our freedom, our freedom of speech uh, and conscience and religion are being shaken. Marriages and families, the foundations of our moral and our ethical values are being shaken. And I don't have to tell any of you, there is a great upheaval that is occurring right now in our land. Now, hear me a minute. Don't turn me off too quick here because I didn't come here today to preach a message of gloom and doom. I have a... I have a uh, rule of thumb when I am dealing with all of our staff people, I always tell them, don't come to me with problems without a solution. And so I'm not here to talk about gloom and doom. I am uh, here this morning to talk to you about a solution, an answer. Uh, God says to us in these rapidly changing times of ours, uh, I want you to come to the place that you trust me. I want you to come to the place that you know me. Now, we've already been told that in these next 30 days of church, we won't be able to come together and to worship in this building, but you know what? We can still worship from home. We're told that uh, if at all possible, uh, you non-essential personnel, I want you to be able to work from home. Many of you students 
uh, right now are experiencing a classroom uh, that is virtual. And your teachers are having to work online to get you your information and uh, to give you, to, for you the opportunity to give uh, your assignments back to them in a virtual platform. We've been told that we should have limited travel. We go into the grocery stores and many of the shelves that are there that we're so accustomed to walking down and seeing them full and stocked and plenty now are empty. It looks like, from a human perspective, that our world has been turned into chaos. And every once in a while, I think you'll agree with me, that our world gets turned upside down. I wonder how many of you listening this morning feel like that your whole world has been shaken, your whole world has been uprooted, your whole world has been turned upside down. I'm going to bring in three things with me this morning that I want to share with you. And first of all, it's this. Um, hope you're ready. Got a pencil, paper, write it down because uh, you're going to need this as a reminder as you uh, go along the way in these next few days. And the first one is this. Not very profound, but it is real. You can expect things in this life to get tough. Um... Uh, Listen to what the Word of God says in 1 Peter chapter 4. It says, Dear friends, don't be shocked or surprised when you suffer through painful tests and trials as if something strange is happening to you. In other words, don't be caught off guard. Uh, don't think that this is unexpected. I'm giving you a warning ahead of time. Life is tough. And then Jesus comes along in John chapter 16 and verse 33, and Jesus says, uh, in this world, you will experience difficulties, but take heart. I have conquered the world. I've told you this so that in trusting me, you will be unshakable and deeply at peace. Je Jesus simply said to all of us, troubles and trials are part of this life. So there's no need for you to get blown away when they happen. There's no need for you to be completely caught off guard and by surprise, Jesus says, I'm telling you, it's just a part of living. Um, so what we have to do to keep from getting blown away, to keep from getting caught off guard, is that we have to have a right view of who Jesus is. And when you have the right perspective of Christ, then you're going to be unmovable. Your life will not cave in when you know who Jesus is. Now, here's the typical response when a storm or a trial hits. The typical response, and, and, and listen, <laughs> uh, you, you just let your mind think for a minute and you'll see that this is exactly what's happened in our day. The typical response is to find somebody to blame. Somebody to place blame on this thing. Somebody to affix the origination of the problem to. And we want to blame this or we want to blame that or we want to blame this other person or that person. May I say to you, when you start blaming people for your problems, you're never going to have the experience of seeing that problem fixed. You're going to, when you start blaming others and other things, the only thing that you're going to wind up doing is perpetuating the problems. The politicians love doing that, don't they? The Republicans blaming the Democrats and the Democrats are blaming the Republicans and the Americans are blaming the Chinese and the Chinese are blaming the Americans and the North Koreans are blaming both. And here we are in this major blame game. When, when you're doing that blame, you're not going to concentrate on being able to fix uh, the issues. Instead of blaming somebody for your problems, in the middle of that problem, you really ought to ask the question, what should I do? Now that the problem is here, what should I do? You, you understand something? Um, problems have an origination. That is true. Where do they originate? Where do our problems come from? I want to tell you, they're one of four sources that your problems come from. You ready to write this down? First of all, you are the cause of the problems. <laughs> 
I, I, understand, Mike Whitson is Mike Whitson's biggest problem. My dumb decisions in life have really caused me more pain, more anguish, and more heartache than any other thing that I could probably tell you about. You understand, I'm looking forward to heaven in a powerful way. You know why I'm looking forward to heaven? Because I don't have to hang out with me when I get to heaven. My, all of my hang-ups, every one of them that I walk around with, deal with on a daily basis, <laughs> all of my hang-ups are going to be gone. Now, if you don't like me down here on this earth, just wait until we get to heaven. You're going to love me up in heaven because I don't have to deal with all of this stuff and this garbage and junk in my own life. Here's the good thing about it. All your hang-ups are going to be gone too. All your imperfections that you walk around with dealing with you yourself, they're going to be eliminated as well. You ought to take your Bible and look sometime today and just go read Romans 7 and it explains how that you are your biggest problem. Now let me tell you another source of our problems is the world itself. Do you know what the world wants to do? The world wants to bring you down to its level. The world wants you to compromise your convictions. The world wants you to conform to its own image and seek after its approval. One of the major things that I watch people do that is so frustrating to me is that they want to live their lives in seeking the approval of the world so that you will give in to its pressure and give up your own ambitions and your own goals. So the world wants to squeeze us uh, into its mold and to its image. Now, another source of our problems is Satan himself. Somebody said, you know, if, if you haven't met the devil head on today, in all probability, uh, you're going in the same direction that he is going. I, I love what John Maxwell said a number of years ago, that one of the tools of Satan is that he wants to keep you discouraged. And he said discouragement is the dark room where the negatives of defeat are developed. You see, if Satan can keep you discouraged, you're never going to be the effective witness for Christ that you ought to be. We already know that God has a wonderful plan, and I'm going to be talking about that in a few minutes. God has a wonderful plan in mind for our life, but don't you ever forget that Satan has a plan for your life uh, as well. And now, the fourth source of our problems, and this may shock some of you, and you may want to debate the theology of what I'm about to tell you, but it, it, you can debate all you want to. It does not diminish the truth of it. God is often the source of the problems that we face. Uh, do you know that God will turn your world upside down sometimes? Are you aware of that? God will absolutely rock your world. But his uh, motives are always good. His reasons are always pure. Now, really doesn't matter the source of your problems. If you trust God, if you rely on God, if you depend on God, and the word says that if you love him and that you are called by God, the word says that the, regardless of the source of where your problems come from, God can be trusted to turn those problems around for your good and for his glory. So the question that I'd like to ask you today is this. So why is your world upside down? Some of you are listening to me today and uh, you, you've had your home to break up. Some of you have had a job loss. Some of you are here and uh, you're so lonely. Uh, you don't have a companion in your life and your great desire is to get married. You, you understand, regardless of what problems you may be facing today, God wants to turn those problems into good. Now, let me just say something. Listen to this statement. 
it's probably one of the more important statements that I'm going to make today. Uh, the source of your problem is really not nearly as important as your response to the problem. Think about that for a few minutes. So we understand that we can expect problems to come. Uh, what we really need to be focusing in on, yeah, problems are going to come, so what? What am I going to do with those problems? What's my response going to be now that those problems are here? Now, the second thing that I, I want to talk to you is what I've just already said, but I want to make it a major point. You can expect problems to come, and you can expect God to turn those problems and use it for good. You know what? One of the things that I'm watching right now is I, I'm looking for ways that God can use me during this very unsettling time. God, what, what about this problem? What, what can I do for good and for your glory uh, now that it's here? Because I don't want to just survive these next 30 days. I want to thrive during these next 30 days. Listen to what the word says in Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, the plans that I have for you are plans for good and not to harm you. They are plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, so we've got the devil's plans out here is to keep you discouraged, uh, to keep you defensive. Uh, God's plans are to take those problems and use it for good and for God's glory. Now, I want you to watch this with me here for just a few minutes, will you? God turns our world upside down oftentimes to display me. To display me. What, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, uh, I just ordered a book by Patrick Lencioni. I've read everything that he's ever written. And uh, he writes from a secular standpoint, but th there's some tremendous spiritual truths that underline every one of them. And, and God has used it to mentor me in a powerful way. And he just uh, has written a book called Motives. And, and it really just uh, asks the question, why do you do what you do? Do you know that sometimes well, God will allow a mountain to come into our life and a problem to come into our life just to show us and to display the motivations of our life, to show us why we do what we do? Now, I'm reading that book and I'm thinking, God, why do I really preach? God, why do I really pastor? Uh, why at 70 years old am I still filled with vigor and, and, and all kinds of vision and, and still want to push forward? Now, uh, why am I doing it? What's the motivation uh, of my life? Um, a lot of my family uh, like hot tea and... Uh, They'll go buy some weird stuff and you, you just really never know what's on the inside of those tea bags until you drop it into hot water. Now the fact of the matter is <laughs> there are a lot of us that really don't know the motivations of our life and what's on the inside of our life until God allows difficulties and problems and circumstances that are uncomfortable and puts us in hot water to display us to us. Powerful word. Um, matter of fact, can I just say to you, God already knows what's on the inside. So he's not allowing these problems so he can see, but to display to us. Do you remember the story of Adam and Eve and they ate of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. You, you all know the story, how that the Bible says that in the cool of the day, God came walking into the garden and he called out, Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam says, well, God, fact of the matter is, uh, I hid myself over there because I was naked and I was ashamed and I was guilty. 
So God didn't come walking into the garden to find Adam. He already knew where Adam was. He just wanted Adam to see where Adam was. To see himself as God had already seen him. Listen to the word of God here. Um, by the way, can I just say this to you? When God was asking the question, Adam, Adam, where are you? When God asks us a question, it is never for his benefit. It's always for our display. It's always for us to know about us. Notice in Jeremiah 17, 10, uh, the Bible says, The Lord searches our hearts and examines our deepest motives so he can give to each person his right reward according to how he is lived. Now, li listen to this statement. Why are these problems happening to my life is not nearly as an important question as what am I going to do now that these problems are here? How am I going to respond to these problems? I was thinking today about the nation of Israel when God delivered them out of Egyptian bondage and they walked around in the desert for 40 years to get into the promised land. Do you know that it was only about a four-month trek uh, from Egypt into the promised land, but it took them 40 years to get there? And, and when you study that whole scenario out in the Word of God, you'll discover that God put them through seven tests while they were wandering in the wilderness. And he would test their faith, and they would fail. And every time that they would fail, God says, well, take another lap around the desert. He would test them again, and they would fail. And he'd say, take another lap around uh, the desert took them 40 years before they got ready. The Bible says that many of them never made it from the time that they were born until the time that they died there in the desert. L listen to Deuteronomy 8. He says, God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Difficult days, problems, sure, everybody has them. You can expect them. But God will take those problems and turn them into good if you'll let him and if you'll trust him. I, I sat uh, sometime this week and I just imagined that wonderful picture of the footprints in the sand. Do, do, do you know the, the picture I'm talking about? Well, you know, that's okay. It's indicative of how that God carried you in the midst of your problems and your difficulties. But what if he didn't leave any footprints in the sand? Psalm 77 says you, you don't even have any footprints uh, in the sand, but I trusted you. What are you going to do when you're not aware that he is holding you? What are you going to do when you're not aware that he's in control and that he is in charge? What, what, we, we're not allowed now to come and to celebrate. Man, I miss the shouting. I miss the hallelujahs. I miss the praise gods. And believe you me, it won't be too long down the road. By the grace of God, we will reconvene and we will join. This too's going to pass. And I miss all of that stuff. And we're going to have a hallelujah celebration when that first Sunday uh, comes that we can join back together again. But may I say to you, God's not nearly as interested in the goosebumps of your life as much as he is when you just walk straight when you come back down. He's not interested in how high you can jump, but how straight you can walk. When you can't see his hand. And he's asking the question to many of us across the board of First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Are you going to serve me when you don't have the goosebumps? Are you going to walk straight? Are you going to do the right things when you don't have those feelings? Our reactions to this pandemic actually is a measuring stick of our faith. 
The Bible compares our trials and our tests to a refiner's fire and how the fire is heated up to a boiling point of the gold and the silver and it causes the dregs to rise to the top and there's a ladle then that comes and skims off the impurities and leaves the gold and the silver through the fire even more pure. I believe with all of my heart that God is testing us to see and to show us if God is really first in our lives. Let me give you the second. Well, let me ask this question first. Um, what are the problems that I am facing today really reveal about me? Sometimes God turns the world upside down to discipline me. Um, every ear this way. W would you give me your undivided attention for just a minute? And I want you to listen to this statement in Hebrews 12. God corrects all his children. And if he doesn't correct you, then you really don't belong to him. God corrects us for our own good because he wants us to be holy as he is. It is never fun to be corrected. In fact, at the time, it is always painful. But if we learn to obey by being corrected, we will do right and live at peace. How many of you, by a show of hands, uh, you believe that you learned something as you were growing up because your parents corrected you? Uh, my hand is straight up. Um, let me, let me just say this and get it out of the way. Uh, parents who don't discipline their kids really don't love their kids. Now, that's not fun, I can tell you that much. I never enjoyed being disciplined. Uh, but I learned an awful lot. I, I learned to keep my smart mouth shut when my mama hit me across the lips a couple of times with a hairbrush <laughs> that she had in her hand at the moment. And it didn't take me long to learn that was not appropriate behavior. Nobody thinks it's fun. And that old statement that you've heard so many times in your life, well, honey, I just want you to know I'm getting ready to discipline you. And it just hurts me a whole lot more than it hurts you baloney. That wasn't true. That was not true at my house. And, and, and it's difficult to discipline the kids when you've got in your heart and you've got in your mind, I really would rather them get away with this than me have to discipline them, but you don't let them get away with it because you love them. You care about them. You want what's best for them. L listen to Hebrews 12. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he says, I will not only shake the earth, but the heavens too. By this he means that he will sift out everything without a solid foundation so that only the unshakable things will be left. About two weeks ago I made that five flavored pound cake that I was talking to you about and one of the processes of making that cake is that you have to sift that flour and I have an old sifter that our grandparents had many years ago and I poured that flour in there and I turned that crank and it sifted that flour. And what it did is that it separated the good from the bad. When God disciplines us, when he corrects us, he is sifting out the eternal from the temporary. The word says, consider yourself fortunate when God all-powerful chooses to correct you. In Job 5, 17, it is so blessed to be disciplined by the Lord. It means, ladies and gentlemen, if you're facing the disciplined hand of God, it means that God loves you. Powerful word. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. It, it, it's an incredible thing to know that God is at work in disciplining you and it confirms to you that you are a child of God. And, and I'm just going to go that negative route for just a minute. If you are without the chastening hand of God, you have absolutely no right to ever believe that you're saved. 
whom he loves, he disciplines. So the question remains is this. What is this problem teaching me? So you stop asking the why and you start asking what? Now God turns our world upside down for a third reason. And that's oftentimes to direct me. It very well could be that God turns your world upside down because you've been going in one direction and God's got something brand new for you. And so he is then really redirecting your life to a brand new path. Listen to Proverbs 16, 9. A person may plan his own journey, but the Lord directs his steps. In Proverbs 20, verse 30, sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. You know, I'm dealing with that right now. I don't know about you. Our church is dealing with that right now. I'm watching this very thing happen right before our very own eyes. That God is putting us through a test. God is putting us through a trial. There's a mountain before us. There are problems that exist. And our church then uh, has the opportunity to get our eyes off of the problem and respond in a manner that is going to be pleasing uh, unto God. I'm watching it happen in my own life. You, you know, churches don't change without pain. People don't change without pain. I, I like this statement. I, I think it came from a pastor in California. And he makes this statement. He says, Change happens not when we see the light, but when we feel the heat. Um, I think about the prodigal son as I'm thinking about that statement. You know, the prodigal, he took his inheritance. The Bible says he wasted it on riotous living. And he wound up that he didn't have anything left. He had lost all of his friends. He had lost his fortune. He had lost his job. He lost everything. And he was in the pig pen. And when he was reduced to nothing, he thought, I don't have to deal with this pain. And it was the very pain that motivated him to go back home and to be restored into a right relationship with his family. Here's, here's, the, here's the ironic thing about this. Do you, do you know that we rarely ever think about, listen, listen, some of you not listening, listen to this. We rarely ever think about the direction of our lives until a problem arises in our lives. We put things on cruise control. We're in the driver's seat. And we don't think about the direction. We just got it on automatic pilot and just headed down the road of our life until a major issue arises that causes chaos and creates pain and all of a sudden that pain gets our attention as to the direction of our life and we're forced to think about things that we would have never thought about otherwise. We would have never thought about on our own. Things that really we have compartmentalized. Things that uh, we are in denial about. And suddenly the problems arise and we're forced to think about those issues that we've swept under the rug. Psalmist said in Psalm 119, he says, I, I've thought about my life and I've directed my feet back to your written instructions. David says, you know what? <laughs> uh, my life has gotten into a mess, but God, now that my life's in a mess, you've got my attention. So let me just ask you. What's the problems that you're facing in your life right now? Are you facing marital problems? Are you facing financial problems? Are you facing some health storms in your life? What are the problems that you are facing? What is that big elephant in the room of uh, your life? And, and, and now that it's there, God says, it, you, now that I got your attention, I want you to know that I am redirecting. You've been going in this direction but I'm ready now for you to go in that direction. And, and the pain caused us to think about that stuff. Let, let, let me put it in a physical sense. 
You know, a fever is not really the disease. A fever is only a symptom of the disease. Um, if you never had a fever, you would never know that there was an infection. But because the fever arises, it indicates that there's some underlying issue that needs to be treated. And so you got to go into a different direction. God takes pain and does the same thing to our lives to redirect us, to come to grips with some underlying problems that we've compartmentalized or that we have refused to deal with. And here's something that you really need to understand about problems. Problems will never leave you in the same way that they found you. Problems never leave you where they find you. You remember the story of Jonah so well, I am sure. Jonah was told by God, I want you to go to Nineveh. He said, no, I'm going to Spain. And uh, he was swallowed up by a whale of a problem. But you'll notice when he was spit up, he was headed in the direction that God wanted him to go. So you ask yourself the question today, where is this problem leading me? The next thing, God shakes up your life. God turns your world upside down, oftentimes to deliver you. Sometimes God's just delivering us from something uh, that is potentially worse than what the problem that we're facing right now is. Uh, a bigger problem, a greater harm. I'll, I'll never forget, uh, somebody convinced me one time uh, to uh, invest $3,000 uh, into a, an opportunity. Hard-headed, I went against what I knew was the will of God, and I wrote the check. And before I knew it, I was in a storm and God used that to deliver me from something that was potentially a whole lot worse than what I got in. Uh, by the way, can I just say to, to you, um, I think this is a parenthetical statement, uh, but I think it needs to be said. Uh, sometimes problems arise in our life from doing the right thing. Uh, problems don't always come because you did the wrong thing. Sometimes problems come in the midst of what you're doing is right. Uh, in Job 36, the Bible says, God has led you away from danger, giving you freedom. I think about Joseph. You remember he said had this dream when he was just a kid and, and said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a ruler over a lot of stuff. And, and his brothers sold him into slavery. He wound up down in Potiphar's house. She accused him of rape. They threw him into prison. But down there in that prison, God used that problem incredibly to get, eventually get him elevated to next to the king of the whole country. God spared him and delivered him from tremendous, potentially difficult problems. I think about Psalm 23, a powerful example, uh, talking about the shepherd. Do you know that the shepherd, in order to protect the sheep, sometimes would break the legs of the sheep uh, and they would break the leg of the sheep that was prone to wander. That sheep that would wander away from the herd or the flock or whatever it's called. And, and when he'd get out there and he would be subject to the predators, uh, to, to, the, to the wild animals that would take his life. And he would wander off and his shepherd would go get him and wander off and the shepherd would go get him and bring him back. Finally, the shepherd said, you know what? In order to save your life, I'm going to break your leg. Oftentimes, God will break our leg to keep us from being devoured by the enemy. He loves us that much. So you may want to ask yourself the question today, how is this problem that I am in the middle of now protecting me? So, so God will also turn your world upside down to develop you or to complete you. Uh, I, I'm convinced that after this pandemic is over, after we've gone through this problem, 
and we've walked with God in the midst of it, I am convinced with all of my heart God is going to use it to strengthen our fellowship and to strengthen our church beyond anything that we would have ever been had it not occurred to begin with. Why? Because we grow through pain. So many people have related to me down through the years. Pastor, you remember uh, how that I was going through that storm in my life? Yeah, Pastor, I, I'm just really grateful to God that I went through that storm because I, I really wouldn't be the man that I am right now had God not allowed me to go through it. Uh, I, it was a horrible time in my life, but God used it in incredible ways to grow me to become who he wanted me to be. I want to say something to you. God has never revealed himself so much to me as he is in these days. There is no way to grow without pain. The very things, listen, the very things right now that you're going through that might would discourage you are the very things that God has allowed to come into your life to develop you. Watch this in 1 Peter 5. After you've suffered for a while, the God of all grace who calls you to share his eternal glory in union with Christ will himself perfect you and give you firmness, strength, and a sure foundation. Let me just say to you, you're not going to take your career to heaven. You're not going to take your car to heaven. You're not going to take your clothes to heaven. The only thing that you're going to take to heaven is your integrity and your character. And right now, God has us in a school down here on this earth to test us and to try us so that you and I could be developed by God. Now, ask yourself the question. How can I grow from this problem? Let, let me, before I go to this last point, and I'll have to do it quickly. Um, you know, what we're facing right now is really not the problem. What, what the problem is, is how we respond to the problem. And am I going to lose my perspective on who God is Am I going to wallow in self-pity? Am I going to get bitter? Or do I have a tendency to blame somebody else? Okay? So let me give you the third and we'll close. Uh, expect God to work even when we don't see him. Sometimes problems come up and you say, you know what? Uh, I, I really, uh, I, I don't understand this because this problem doesn't make a bit of sense to me. Uh, I'm not learning anything about myself. Uh, I, I don't sense that God is chastising me. I, I don't believe that I am growing. I don't believe I'm being developed. Uh, I don't believe God, I don't see him redirecting my life. This problem doesn't make sense. Now listen to Proverbs 20. Since the Lord is directing our steps, why try to understand everything that happens along the way? Can I say to all of us today, it is really foolish to try to figure God out. You're not going to understand his ways. The Bible says that his ways are way beyond our ways. And if we could figure out God, we wouldn't need him. Trust in the Lord, he says, with all your heart. And lean not into your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him. And he will give you a life of success. He will direct your paths. Now here's my job as pastor right now. It's to help you and to help this church navigate the waters that you and I are in. I not only want you to survive, I want you to thrive. And when we come to this, I want First Baptist Church Indian Trail to have an even greater impact for Christ in the lives of the people in this community and all over the world. That we may know him, be blessed by him, expose him, propagate him, preach him, sing him all over this world like we never ever have before. So I want to lead us now in a time of prayer. Would you gather your family around now and, and join hands together in your family 
embrace one another, and I want us to seek the Lord for just a minute. Would you let me pray for you and over you and with you right now uh, as we seek the Lord? Maybe you would just pray something like this. Lord, um, never faced anything like we're facing right now. And God, I want you to show me, me. And God, if there is something in me that ought not to be there, maybe, God, I've made some wrong decisions. Maybe I've gone in the wrong direction. I've made some bad choices in my life. God, I receive your discipline. I receive your correction. God, I thank you that it is a great sign that you love me. And maybe, God, uh, it's time for me to go into a different direction. Lord, would you make it clear and plain and unmistakable to me which direction you'd have me to go. And God, maybe these problems that I'm facing in my life right now are just your divine protection to keep something more difficult in happening into my life. So I want to thank you for that. And Lord, I want to thank you for the problems that are here to make me more mature and to make me more complete. And God, for your Holy Spirit, I do want to trust you with my whole heart. God, I want to honor you in everything about me. Now, while your heads are still bowed and your eyes are still closed, maybe there's a many of you who have really never placed your faith and your trust in Jesus. God has shown you that you don't have a relationship with him. That you're still in your sin. Still on the way to hell. Don't have the assurance that when you die you're going to heaven. I want you to right now be willing to turn away from sin. And trust Jesus as your Savior. And would you pray something like this? Heavenly Father, I do believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead on the third day. God, please forgive me of all my sin. With your help, right now, I'll turn away from sin. And with your help, Oh God, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you that you're a God of your word. And your word says that if I'll just call on you, you'd save me. And I'm asking you to save my soul. Thank you for hearing me pray. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving me. And all God's people said amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with me just then as I prayed it, right underneath the video that you're watching, there's a little place right in the middle of the screen that says, I prayed to receive Christ as my Savior. Would you take the mouse or if you've got the ability to just push it with your finger would you click on that one section right there I prayed to receive Christ as my Savior it'll carry you to a form that I'd like to ask you to fill out that you would give me your name and your address I'd love to be able to send you something that would help you to continue to grow to become who God wants you to be oh he's done a great work in your heart and your life and I don't want you to be ashamed of that Tell the people that are in your family. Make sure that I know. You know what? Listen, I promise you this. There's absolutely nothing that would encourage me more than to know that God used this message to change your life. Please take time today to let me know. And I'll thank you. God bless you for tuning in today. Pray for us as we continue to look for unique ways in which to be able to get the gospel out and to do it better than ever before. Thank you for your support.
bless. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.